but Joel finally got Wait a second, I saw somebody in an airport once. I don't remember where or who. Joel? Can't hear you guys. I might come back in. Okay, can you hear me now? Nope. There we go. Okay. Hey, bud. Hey, hey Gary, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. How you doing? What's going on, Joel? Family. family healthy? Thank God. Yeah, doing good. Yours? Thank God. How's, right. the, uh, how's the expectant mother? Do you want me to share the document in the beginning? Uh, I think we'll share the document. Uh, let's see. Where do I have that? Because the person, I, the, spe the uh, wealth advisor I have on, she's not going to be able to be on. So I'm going to use that part of it. So okay. I would say share it. Uh, Maybe around the, just after we're done with the charities. Well, yeah. you'll tell me when. You'll say, I'd like you know, Alan right, share it now or something like that. Yeah, okay. That's fine. Yep. You got it. I have it. It's on my screen. I can share it at any time. Good. How you doing? I'm good. How are you, buddy? You got to spend some time with me to teach me how to do this sharing. Sure. I can't figure it out. Yeah, I got it. I got it straight. I know you do. There's Aaron. Joel. No, Joel. Good. Hear me? Got it. Hey guys, Joel, can you hear me? I can hear Aaron. Aaron. Yep, we can hear you. Can hear it. I have no idea, Gary. At some point, maybe you can after this call. I've been trying to get on with video. I finally figured out the audio, but I can't uh, the video. I'm not sure. So, are you on your computer, okay. Aaron? I'm on my iPad. Yeah. If you're on your iPad, you look go down the left hand corner, touch it. Yeah. Oh, just turn right off. Touch down at the bottom of your, in the left-hand corner, you'll see a thing that says start video. It's got a red, well, video camera. It says stop video. It has a red line across it. Right. Touch that. Touch that. Where is it down the left-hand corner? Yeah, left-hand corner. There's a mute and there's a stop video. Um, I have nothing on this one here. Hey, Richie. You got to touch it. No, you got to touch it to make it appear. It doesn't appear normally. You got to yeah. kind of. All right. Okay, you gotta kind of drag, it, drag your hope, drag your cursor to the right bottom. I'm touching on touching. something in the lower left hand corner. It feels yes, lower left hand corner near the bottom. It doesn't appear. You have to touch there to make it appear. Hi, Miles. Okay. Hi, Jen. Hey, how you so doing? Do this way. Could it be any other place? Aaron, according to uh, my records, you are on video. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Miles. Hey, Dan. How you doing? Hi, Rabbi. Good. How are you doing? Great. Let me stop the recording. We're getting it starts well, recording right away, which we don't want. It's recording now. I stopped it now. Hey, this webinar um, is covers a whole yeah. lot of things, and. Uh, I want to thank uh, everybody for joining us. Uh, last week, we had an outstanding discussion with well thought out questions about the emotional effects uh, of the post COVID virus. We should look at COVID-19 as an opportunity to reset, look at what the new normal might look like and the way, and, and the way th the, and, and be ready for what's going to happen next. Um, we should have the forethought to appreciate that there will be another pandemic and we have to look at how we are going to be prepared. Rabbi, Rabbi Iggy from the Teshuva Center was extraordinary in sharing his time and viewpoints about the emotional future of COVID and what the new normal will look like. Tonight, there's a lot to cover. I've interviewed many people in my research about the, what the new normal might look like, and we'll talk about that uh, as it compares to several industries. Um, I will share some thoughts from some specialists that I asked to speak. Uh, on certain topics. And I want to thank Alan Budman for his wonderful job that he's been doing 
on these webinars. Some of the things I discuss, appreciate that I'm not an expert at it. Uh, it's just from research, interviewing, passion, and, and, and talking to financial managers as well. Uh, some of them are my educated opinions on a lot of this. If you have any questions, just ask Alan uh, through the uh, chat, through the chat. So just a couple of quick thoughts. Out of every crisis comes an opportunity, and it's how we take those opportunities and what we make of them that makes us successful. Innovation uh, always occurs in the times of crisis, and I think uh, FJMC and I think uh, Foundation has found some of those innovations. So the question I have is how long will it take to come back to full employment and, the, and or employment that's less than 6%? That's a big question to answer. Um, what is appealing to look at in being prepared against a severe downturn? I will give a few thoughts on that later on. The couple, I'm gonna start by talking about the physical effects and just spend a minute or two on that. Um, of post coronavirus on our bodies. So most of, many of us are doing series. We're, we're doing uh, Netflix and, and Prime Video and things like that. And we're also at our computers doing Zoom meetings. And we're also at meetings uh, um, all over the place uh, in, in our businesses. So what does that mean to our bodies? means that physically, we're, we're, many of us, and it's already started with neck pain, shoulder pain, back pain, and it's only going to get worse as time goes on as, as Jim Handler is uh, stretching his neck out. So I'm just going to give a couple ideas on things that we can do to combat that. Uh, getting up every 30 to 45 minutes is a really nice thing. Getting up and walking around. Um, it, a Dr. David Elfrig, uh, is one of the newsletters that I read, and he describes the 10 most important things in, in uh, health. And I picked the first four of them because they're consistent from year to year. And the most important thing is movement. Movement, uh, doing yoga, movement, uh, just getting up and moving around, walking. I'm sure everybody has heard that, but the importance of it can't be overemphasized. Um, the next one is sleep. And Without movement, sleep becomes difficult. Um, meditation. We should never belittle meditation. Art Spar, one time, many of you know Art, one time taught us a meditation called yud hey vuv -Hey. It's quite an interesting meditation. Um, but meditation allows you to heal. It allows you to relax your mind. And for me, it makes me very creative because my mind does relax and move in different directions. Um, and believe it or not, the fourth one is massage. Uh, massage uh, loosens the, the muscles, gets uh, rid of the lactic acid. We drink water and we flush all those free radicals out of our system. So that's a, just a little bit on the post-coronavirus uh, effects on our bodies. The next thing I wanna talk about or uh, have everyone talk about is charities. Uh, charities are gonna be struggling during the post-coronavirus period. Uh, with almost 20% unemployment. How quickly that'll come back, we don't know. I'm gonna first start with charities in our synagogues. Um, Aaron Altman is the past president of Dix Hills Synagogue, and he's right in the trenches of his synagogue right now and trying to figure out how they're gonna survive. We have synagogues that are failing, synagogues that are merging. So I'm gonna ask Aaron to talk a little bit about what the future he's facing. Aaron? Okay, can you guys hear me? Yep. Thank you. Uh, just by way of introduction, uh, for those who don't know what Dix Hills is, uh, we are about 50 miles uh, out of New York City or Manhattan. We are in the epicenter of uh, the coronavirus uh, uh, epidemic, or pandemic. And I will say that as I talk to people around the country, I don't think they necessarily have uh, the same, uh, I'll call it fear, that we have here. Uh, I also would like to say that whatever I, I, I will say in the next few minutes, basically uh, is my opinion, um, and it's based upon being the president of my synagogue, as well as being uh, involved with the FJMC, and also involved with, with our region. Um, so if, let me first say that when this first came on, we had really no idea. 
And I, and, you know, Gary had asked me to say, what, would, what do we look like at the end of this uh, pandemic? And uh, the answer really is, is we really don't have an idea where we, we're going to go with this. At the very beginning, we thought that this was going to be, let's say, over or at least controllable by maybe April, maybe you know, the beginning of May. Certainly not where we are looking at now. Right now, if in our area alone, we are looking probably towards the third quarter, maybe the fourth quarter, and some kind of reopening. And in all likelihood, that is not necessarily going to be the kind of reopening that we are going to have. Uh, it has become in uh, discussions with the board and also with other synagogues. And there are about 30 synagogues, 30 to 40 synagogues in the conservative movement are located on Long Island and probably another dozen or so that are probably in the uh, uh, New York um, city area. That includes all the boroughs of New York. And if you talk to individuals in each one of these synagogues, and I have, maybe not all synagogues, is that they are taking it day by day. Uh, and that includes uh, Dix Hills. Uh, you know, we're looking at where do we go? So the first question that came up is, in terms of a budget, is how many people do we think we're going to lose? Uh, and that was a whole discussion in terms of numbers. Is it 50%? Is it 30%? Is it 10%? And the answer is we really don't know. Um, so when you take a look at where we are going to be heading uh, as, as, a, as a synagogue, as a community, uh, the other side of it is, is something that, that's so uncertain that um, it became almost paralyzing in terms of how we look at it. Gary had mentioned something that says, how do we take a, a bad situation and uh, maybe make something better out of it. So I, I'm gonna highlight two things uh, uh, in, in this discussion. Uh, the first thing is, as many of our synagogues have become uh, streaming out there, we began to see, maybe you've seen it in your own synagogues and own communities, is that a lot of individuals, not even members of our synagogue, appearing on uh, the streaming uh, lists in terms of the Zoom. Uh, we were getting maybe 100 people for a Shabbos. We're now getting 170 people or 180 people. Where we're getting, you know, say 40 or 50 for a class, we're getting maybe 100 people for that class. And as we took a look at this, um, or let's, I'll say from my point of view, uh, take a look at this, I saw this as perhaps an opportunity. And the opportunity that I saw is something similar that happened in the early 2000s. I had been involved with the photographic industry. And in the early 2000s, uh, there was the uh, analog business of film camera and the digital business that was coming on board. And at the beginning, it was running side by side. Eventually, digital took over. Uh, fast forward a little bit. Uh, we go to 2006, 2007, e-tailing versus brick and mortar. There's the conflict. Uh, eventually, that's being resolved. And there's a little bit of where those individuals that were... Um, you know, in the brick and mortar, who then embraced the uh, uh, e-tailing business, have really not only thrived but, uh, or survived, but they've been thriving in this, like a Walmart or, or Target. Others that have not, like Sears, have fallen by the wayside. And so the opportunity that I, that I saw was perhaps what we need to do is to take a, uh, a look at um, maybe uh, two task forces or two directions. One, our brick and mortar, how do we maintain it? How do we keep it? How, what do we do? And another one is perhaps take a look at the streaming side of it. Uh, in our area alone, 40% of the Jewish families that are located on Long Island are unaffiliated. Is there a way to connect with the unaffiliated that will bring them in, maybe not into the synagogue right away, into the brick and mortar, but perhaps into spirituality? Uh, maybe there's a way to monetize it maybe get involved with different uh, events, you know, uh, affinity groups, whatever the, those things may be. So that, that there's maybe an opportunity uh, with that. The other observation, and there's a lot of things that we could talk about or I could talk about, but the other, op the other opportunity, maybe it's not an opportunity, but it's an observation. Um, I read today where there was in Jewish Week, there was an article and the article had interviewed about a dozen conservative Jews uh, Jewish rabbis throughout this area. And the question really had come, and, and maybe Rabbi Iggy could talk to it a little bit as well, about the halacha about bringing in cameras 
into the sanctuary on Shabbos, not just simply as a temporary measure, but to actually bring it in and maybe make it part of the actual uh, 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 services and what, uh, on a more permanent basis. Um, and the question had gone to a number of these rabbis, and so their answers were basically very self-serving in my opinion. They were talking about that. Some of them said, it's good, but only temporarily. And maybe the other one said, well, no, I don't think so. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, we shouldn't really be looking at it at, at all because this is really against anything that we, we believe in. And uh, it's really uh, you know, against the Shabbat and, and things like that. And I started to think about if we continue in looking at this uh, way in this very parochial way, that if we're looking at the other end of where we will be, and we will be different, no matter what we say, there is no more norm the way we knew it. If we look at it in the, in the rear view mirror as if we want to come back to some kind of norm, and we take a look at all these different aspects of what's going on, I think we will be uh, in probably worse shape uh, than, than we think. However, if we take the opportunity and we start to go out there and um, communicate with our community, communicate on a regular basis, explain who we are at times of, of pandemic, and explain the services that we bring to the community, to our congregation, to those that are willing to, to hear. And we do this on a consistent basis to create some kind of strategy that engages the streaming of, uh, of that we have started in this digital age and uh, embrace that and work together. And, and third, if we start to really uh, change in the way we, we, we take our message, I think we can come out of this better. It'll take time. You know, right now there, from what I see here, uh, it's gonna probably take more time. Maybe it'll be the beginning of 2021, I'm not sure. But um, to me, it's what Gary had said, is how do we take this and make this an opportunity? But I'll tell you something. Uh, I see a lot of resistance, you know, the, the word conservative, uh, I think not only talks about our movement, but it also talks about how we react. And sometimes uh, if we don't act quick enough, this will uh, be an opportunity lost and maybe lost uh, forever. Um, so I mean, I have much more, but that's the, the highlights that I wanted to talk about. That was great. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, we'll take questions as we go along. but. Uh... Next, uh, let's have Rabbi Iggy speak on uh, national charities and um, address this crisis and what his perspective will look like in fundraising and in and the increase in anxiety as a result of coronavirus. Um, also, we've seen a significant increase in domestic violence and how will this change or look like for families as, as we move forward? Rabbi? Rabbi there? Um, okay, he's on hold. We'll come back to Rabbi Hello. Iggy. Oh, sorry. That's okay. You're on. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so I had to step up. I apologize. I just stepped up from the bathroom for a second. Would you just, uh, would you give me the prompt again? So I was, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you're going to talk about uh, the effect of coronavirus on our national charities and address the crisis um, and what, your perspective is will look like in fundraising and talk about the increase in anxiety as a result of the coronavirus. Uh, and maybe you want to touch on uh, what's going on with uh, the, the serious increases in domestic violence and how that will look post coronavirus. Yeah, I mean, that already looks horrible. I mean, all of it looks horrible. I mean, from, from the very basic thing, if you talk to people like, I, you know, I speak with Svi Glock from Amudi him all the time right, uh, which is sort of a charity that deals with a lot of uh, abuse, um, right, coronavirus, of course, sort of like uh, the quarantine mix, both the abuser and the abused be in the same situation and people can't escape. So there's already a lot of, uh, a lot of attention, both in the media in general, about a lot of what's going on in terms of abuse and, and domestic violence. And, and, and that's uh, really uh, sort of growing in numbers I, I shared last week but I'll, I'll do it again to sort of that um the 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 new york hospitals at least the ones i can speak with right the new york hospitals at least right are seeing um right people going into the psychiatric wards uh, increased in numbers in significant numbers for people who did not have prior psychiatric issues that is so sort of like these new cases if you will of, of psychiatric and psychological issues is increasing by a measurable amount that, that so much so that the doctors are actually noticing it uh, uh, 
really heavily. Um, and, and, you know, so, so that I spoke a little bit about last week, but in terms of charities, right, one of the, one of the, the things that are, are um, really um, alarming is that a lot of facilities, including the 92nd Street Y in New York or the JCC in Manhattan, are facing um, real danger. That is sort of like their sustainability is in fact um, up in the air. That is sort of like, it's not a given. Yes, a lot, some of them have endowments and they can go from there. But, but in that sense, their ability to sustain long-term is very, very, very difficult. And, and with, let's say the URJ who just uh, right, sort of like uh, um, uh, lay off 20% of their staff, right? The reform movement just lay off 20% of the staff you have not only a lot more people looking for work, but a lot more people looking for charity and the institutions themselves can't handle it. Um, camps, right? National things like Rama, uh, just had a conversation with, with Rama last week. Um, and they, right, so like there's one, the la one of the la la last camps to sort of like decide to close their, their, their summer program, Camp Rama in New England, for example, um, just sent an email saying with, with refund tuitions, Right, right now, just for basic operation, they're, they're 1.75 million in the hole, just, just because of this, this summer. So, right, and this is just the beginning of this. Um, people are, uh, people who are uh, giving, or at least had pledges to usually give like 100, 200, 300,000, are now giving 20,000, 30,000, 50,000. Um, and a lot of charities and a lot of sort of, uh, um, including my own, right, including the Chuba Center, are really concerned about the, the ability to fundraise, um, the ability to actually sort of like make people spend money, right? We're talking, for example, again, in New York, which is what I know, 14% of people, 14% of, of, of residents in New York left New York are not in New York at the moment. So, right, these are the 14%, which are usually sort of like the higher echelons of life, right? These are not sort of people who can't afford, right? And the largest, the largest, uh, 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 the biggest uh, uh, concentration of people leaving New York is for East Hampton, right? So in that sense, sort of white flight and what's going on in terms of the cities is also translating into people not wanting to give. People are a lot more conservative with the money they have. People don't know what's going on. The, the stock market, I don't have to tell any of you, is like, you know, like I don't even want to look at it because it's like it's so depressing, right? So they can't think, right? And, and in that sense, um, people are just really, really afraid. And if you talk to the UJA, federations, um, philanthropy has completely sort of come to a halt at this particular moment. There's a lot of small campaigns and, you know, they had Giving Tuesday Now, which was a couple of weeks ago. But um, in times of insecurity, right, we tend to right, close the purses. In times of insecurity, we don't know what this would look like. We don't know where the money is going to go. We don't know how much money we're going to need. Um, we are far less able to give to charity as also in times of, of pandemic like this, what is charity? What can you give becomes also a little more, um, I would say amorphic, right? I think a lot of people are just not sure how it looks like and people just like waiting for us, waiting for it to be over. They're waiting for it to be over so they know how everything shakes out. And there's a lot of places that are going to sort of shut down, including camps um, that just cannot afford doing that. I know um, I have a few colleagues who already, and these are sort of the, at the executive levels, who've been laid off. I have a few colleagues who work for nonprofits, for charities, who've been laid off, who just do not have a job anymore. Um, and they work for, again, for institutions like, um, uh, like, uh, schools, right? Uh, Schechter schools, uh, Jewish board, sort of charities that sort of had re relatively large budgets, not small little sort of, um, you know, mom and pop charities who are just laying off. And I think part of the question is, what is a responsibility to the charities that are already there? And not to mention the charities that we're going to have to start create. So, so luckily, for and luckily, that's the wrong word, but like uh, uh, for us, right, we know that what we do is needed. We know that sort of what we do with 
with recovering addicts, with people who have lost their ability, people who've lost lives, people who've lost meaning, that for us, sort of, right, sort of those are the people that we help on a day-to-day basis, people with insecurities, anxieties, all the work that we do within the mental health realm, all the work we do within addiction, within uh, incarceration, mental health awareness. So, so we are at the forefront of this. So we're quote unquote needed. So I'm not as concerned uh, as for others, but, but there's a real concern as to what are we able to really sustain? Because if everybody's losing both their jobs and their ability, it, it becomes very hard to also sustain all the charities around. And we have to think about it. And the only thing, the last thing I would say about that is sort of that for a lot of charities, and this is an interesting thing for all of us to think about, uh, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who, who runs a uh, summer camp um, and he has to let go of the majority of his staff. And I said, you know, but you also get an opportunity to now rebuild it, right? Part of the opportunity is like, now you're going to start from scratch. So all the people that you couldn't fire, all the people that you had to have, there, all people who were there for 30 years, all the people like all the guard that was there, if you really want to restructure, now is a really good time. And we have to ask how we leaner, because I think the question is how we leaner is a personal question. I think every one of us has to think like, okay, what is, what is need and what is want, right? How do I discern between what I need and what I want in my own life? How do I pare down, right? Both my, my life and everything else, right? Now that I can't sort of just like soothe myself with socializing, with, right? With sort of like drinking, with eating, with going out, whatever. Who are the people that I really want in my life? And I want to make an effort to, because Zoom is, is in fact exhausting. Um, and who, you know, and who do I not? And so that leaning out is true for personal. I think it's true for, for things fundamentally. Um, and it also is going to change everything around. I know people read the Washington Post today, but this fascinating article about how companies, stores, are changing everything from how you fold your jeans at, uh, at the gap for them to, right, for you to touch as less as possible to how do you pick up things, right? How do you have a makeup counter at Bloomingdale's? I mean, there's a lot of sort of like real questions about this leaning out, which I think sort of is both spiritual and physical, but also um, definitely has to do with commerce and things. And, and in, lastly, again, in terms of the philanthropy, I think we're gonna see enormous drop in major gifts, in, in major gifts. And, and for a lot of organization, that's gonna be really difficult because we're gonna to have to fire people and we're gonna to have to lean out um, in spite of ourselves. And look at some uh, creative ways of fundraising, if you will. Um, and I'm hoping, I mean, I think we've come up with a couple, but um, I interviewed, she's not on, uh, she just called me last minute. Uh, I interviewed uh, two CEOs of federations uh, and a uh, director of development and management office. And also in Cincinnati, I interviewed a person that was ahead of our, uh, uh, our, our foundation. And I asked them some of these similar questions. And they had some interesting answers. We happen to be doing pretty well in Cincinnati um, and uh, here, here's um, a, a little bit about what they've said. I'm going to start with early childhood, because that, that's one of the things that our federations... Oh, before I start that, uh, to your point, Rabbi, uh, I, I just read a huge article on the deep layoffs at uh, the Jewish Federation of North America. Over 30% of their staff was cut. Um, that almost doesn't bode well. So that, that hits right exactly to what you're talking about. Um, so the first thing uh, that they talked about was early childhood and where you might have eight or 10 or 15 or 20 people, kids in your, and, and one or two teachers, they are now having to get um, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 teachers for every four or five kids and create that basically social distancing. So that is good. that's a new normal already that they're talking about. One of the things that came out that I thought was quite interesting is something they called uh, generational differences. And they're seeing a difference between what the baby boomers, um, the effect it's having on them, uh, meaning toward the federations, and the, the baby boomers' children and the, and the uh, millennials, they all have a different area. It's not like 
it, 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 it's not like it includes everyone uh, in the same boat. Everyone has their own, there's different issues. I thought that was kind of a, a interesting thing. Uh, um, as far as um, our foundation is concerned, one of the things I thought was very interesting, and Aaron Altman's been beating this into the ground uh, using um, um, something called Classy. And her point was that was that's Classy is similar to what she was talking about, and that is more people who are part of your organization have to be part of the fundraising effort. It can't occur from just one or two or three or four people. It has to come from everybody and everybody has to, has to be part of that fundraising. A couple of things that I've, I've observed and, and, and thought about is number one, we have to find types of fundraisings that create um, sustained fundraising, but we're, we have something that, that people can continue to give to, but creating value for service. And what do I mean by value for service? We started a program called Wine on the Vine. That's a typical value for service. We're giving somebody service for buying a vine, planting in Israel, and we're giving revenue back to, uh, coming back, some of that revenue comes back to the organization. Everybody, a lot, of pe a lot of conservative Jews, Orthodox Jews, they drink kosher wine. So this is a golden opportunity, plus it supports Israel. The other thing with wine on the vine that I think is quite interesting is that we're gonna be able to work on, and, and other charitable things can work this way too, is revenue sharing with, uh, or, or collaboration. So you're collaborating with different organizations or you're revenue sharing with your clubs, with your, with your uh, regions, and we're talking about that. Hopefully we're gonna pin that down this week. So that's, that's another thing. Um, so those are some ideas on, on, um, uh, on fundraising that I thought about. Anybody have any questions up to now? Okay. Um, let, me, uh, let me just also note, Gary, that we're gonna have a webinar on Sunday at one o'clock, where we're gonna have Adam Bellows, who's the head of Wine on the Vine. He's going to describe it, how to teach us how it works, and uh, make us understand how we can not only help FJMC, but also connect to Israel as well. Uh, we're gonna follow that uh, with, uh, we don't have dates yet, but we're gonna, he's gonna do a wine tour of each of his wineries. I think there are six of them, whatever the number is. And he's gonna spend uh, about 20 minutes or so doing a tour of each winery, which is then gonna be shown uh, to a new group that we're starting called Affinity Groups. And Affinity Groups are basically, you know, common interest groups. So people who are interested in wine could join that Affinity Group and see those tours. Okay, so look for that. That's coming very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Uh, I'm going to get some, uh, Steve? Yes, yeah, so um, many of my colleagues who are physicians um, in decades have not joined Zooms and live streaming at synagogues. And now they're doing so in exponential numbers because they're really feeling as though the synagogues are becoming relevant. Um, and I think that f from my sort of opinion, what we're doing in the conservative movement is as opposed to the reform movement that has the Religious Action Center, the Commission on Social Action, that they're addressing the mental health issues which we're attempting to do. And I think we have to, as you said, the generational differences, but as Rabbi Igri pointed out, the mental health issues, we're all concerned about our physical health, but now our mental health, and our synagogues, our clergy, our foundation, if we can make things more relevant and feel like we're talking to the person and relating to them, then they'll better relate to us and maybe you know give a little more money or sponsor um, a program. So I think that uh, we sort of need to sort of bridge that gap that um, uh, from, from what, 
people tell me in the Orthodox synagogue, did they talk about the coronavirus? No, they talked about the Parsha. So in the Reform synagogue, they're talking about mental health, and the um, synagogues have addressed in Shabbos services suicides, which how many conservative synagogues have done so. So Adam, uh, Aaron, so those are my thoughts in terms of how do you make it more relevant, and how do these people feel like they belong, and uh, we uh, they're not just being spoken to by accolades, but how to feel that they're getting something in return. Great point, Steve. Um, yeah, I mean, did I oh. see somebody else's hand up? Yeah, Gary. Go ahead, Rabbi. Um, I, I would say, right, it's, it's interesting. I'm hearing about like, you know, wine on the vine and, and all that. But like, I think that one of the challenges is, is right, Dr. Mandel saying, one of the challenges is to see mental health as a commodity. That is, right, so like, because it's now up to us, now that we know, right, now that we actually know how it feels like to be stuck at home with children, without children, with a job, without a job, now that we all feeling like the way we're feeling secluded, anxious, all that, now we don't have the ability for us to say, oh, we don't know. We know that this is a commodity. We know that this is something that's important to invest in. And we know that if there's another pandemic that hits, we're going to have the responsibility, like what are we doing now to make sure that all these people, all the charities, whatever, not just the Chuba Center, but otherwise, how do we invest in mental health, right? You say that people are going back to the synagogues as a center and the relevance, so we have to build on that, right? We have to make sure that the relevance of what we know now that is, can affect us is, is really something that we, that we deal with, is really something that we remember, right? That we remind ourselves and others Right, that this is not something we want. We want to be more robust in our mental health. And we want to make sure that when the next things happen, whether it is pandemic or not, we're ready to support the individuals, to support the communities, to support their families, and to support ourselves. Right? And and that takes investment in infrastructure, in education, in content, in breaking the shanda about, about mental health, and also about our ability to, to really reach out and help those among us, our children, our brothers and sisters, right? Addiction, mental health, all these things, we now have the responsibility to do so and to support the organizations and the people, they are going to create the infrastructure that when the next thing hits, we'll be prepared. Thanks, Rabbi, very good. Um, next, I'm gonna ask uh, my good friend, Joel Kling. Joel is, I believe IT head of IT at a big corporation, uh, yeah, a yeah. bank. I'm chief uh, peon. You know, chief peon at the uh, at a Fifth Third Bank in Cincinnati, and Joel deals with the IT issue. And I want I asked him to speak on um, on what that post IT is going to look like uh, in 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 uh, these corporations. Thanks, Gary. I mean, I think you know, ten weeks ago. Um, I had a conversation with my boss and uh, he said, I think we should probably work from home, you know, pretty quickly here based off what I'm hearing. Within a day, pretty much all of our IT staff um, at our bank was um, pretty much told we're gonna work from home. And at first we stopped doing any changes. We stopped doing any major stuff. We needed to figure out what the new normal was. We had people that were having trouble getting, you know, you know the network bandwidth was terrible. And, you know, very quickly, our, our network team, every night they were implementing changes. And now that we're 10 weeks later, we're looking at a uh, situation where um, it works. And our folks are able to, um, you know, they're able to get the job done. We're, we're making changes. We're putting enhancements in. We're fixing problems. And, you know, we've, we've proven it works. And I think what's gonna happen, you know, in our discussion about when do we go back, there is no date right now. If we don't have to right now, we're not going to. So we're gonna to continue to, um, hold on a second. Sorry, daughter just came home. Um, but basically, um, we're, we're starting to see that we don't have to be in the office to get things done. We don't have to be in the office to be successful. And the other thing that I'm seeing is there's a blurring of the lines. And what I mean by that is that while we were on this call, one of my guys who works second shift sent me a, you know, a message through Microsoft Teams. I replied back. I'll probably hit him up after this call on some other things. So 
my eight hour day that might have been eight to five is now maybe a nine hour day, maybe 10 hour day between eight and midnight. So the blurring of the lines there, you know, that I find if you're working from home, you're constantly seeing people uh, online. Um, like I said before, the challenge of the network and the, and the infrastructure, we've, we've built that out enough, you know, in our area that working from home should not be an impediment. We got a tech desk downtown that if you need to go get your computer serviced, there's guys there all the time. You go down there, one of my guys yesterday got a battery replaced and was back home in an hour. So, you know, we're, we're adapting, we're figuring out how that works. I mean, you look at Verizon statistics, they've, you know, their bandwidth has increased. I get a text about every three weeks telling me my hotspot has an extra couple gig. You know, so they're doing whatever they can to try and help out as well. And, you know, WebEx and Zoom, I think I'm going to, I'm not going to steal Gary's thunder here on um, a topic you'll have in a minute or two, but I've noticed with WebEx and Zoom that there's that half a second delay. So when you're talking, somebody else accidentally interrupts you. And I think, you know, Gary, I'll let, I'll let you talk about 5G and all that. But basically, I think there's going to be a push to get faster so that it's easier. I'll stop there and see if questions or comments. Great. Thanks, Joel. Um, uh, I think next, um, I'm just going to mention the effects, post-coronavirus effects on commercial real estate, because we have a lot of Jews in commercial real estate. I think I think we're in for a one to ten year uh, decline in commercial real estate uh, situation because of what Joel just talked about. <coughs> you know, I've talked to a lot of people, even the, our federation, and people are working from home and are actually enjoying it more. And I think that uh, there's going to be a lot less commercial businesses. Uh, having offices in 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 uh, the, the buildings they've had offices in in the past. Um, this could be the new normal or part of the new normal. I think that's happening. Uh, another thing I observed was online shopping for groceries. Uh, right now, five to eight percent of the population does online shopping for groceries, but uh, they think they feel that once somebody does it once or twice, that has exponential growth potential. Um, telemedicine, that is the future of medicine. I'm going to let Steve talk on that uh, a little bit. Um, my daughter is a veterinary oncologist, and she's now doing a lot of tele uh, online medicine for veterinarians. I'm actually beginning to do a little bit, uh, but Steve can talk about it from the medical perspective. Steve? Um, I've been doing telemedicine um, for the last two weeks. Um, in addition to uh, my patient responsibilities. And patients appear um, with the technology, and it's generally more the younger people, they appreciate the time set aside where you're giving them uh, undivided attention, and at the same time, uh, responding to their needs. They don't need to come to the office, they could schedule an appointment online, there's no waiting room, um, and it becomes efficient. For the people who are older, it's a major challenge uh, for those who have to understand doximity or one of the other uh, Facebook uh, issues. But it's becoming more efficient. Um, I think physicians are very concerned. Um, there are two types of doctors. There are those who do procedures, um, such as surgeons, and those who do medical treatment. Those who are doing uh, procedures are extremely concerned because they can't do their procedures online. Those who do the visits and are medical doctors are even more concerned because even the, some of the procedures that they do, they can't generate an income. So the physicians who are in private practice and those who are in the medical specialties um, are worried. Um, they're very worried. And those in the surgeons are waiting for the places to be open when at least temporarily the patients who are afraid to go to the hospital. I think the uh, last thing is what Rabbi Ige said, yes, we have a coronavirus now, but one quarter of every family has someone who has a mental illness or a mental issue, whether it's anxiety, loneliness, and so on. So although we might focus for the next 
60 days or 120 days on coronavirus, um, I think we need to look at the overall picture of good mental health, family relationships, divorce rates, um, uh, whether drug abuse, alcoholism, gambling, other addictions uh, that we don't really think or uh, condemn uh, as much as um, having stigmas upon those who might be um, non-functional. So I think it, this is an opportunity for us that we uh, need to open the doors to our synagogues um, and our community to show how we are relevant to them and that we're there in supporting them, just like um, we're supporting Covenant House and we're supporting all the other organizations. Our synagogues are the, um, are the framework that are keeping our families together. I'm um, not going to get into um, one of the, to me, the most exciting thing uh, that I've been wanting to talk about for quite a while. And as it were, um, FJMC produces a newsletter called Health, Wealth, and Retirement. And Richard Gray and Steve Mandel and myself are editors, and, and Richard's the main editor of, the, of this. And we've been writing articles on 4G and 5G for a while. I, I wanted to talk about the intersection of 4, 5G with post-coronavirus. Uh, but to get a little understanding in 4G, I'm going to have Richard talk about that. And then I'll talk about 5G. And then we can, anybody else that has something to add to it can. Because this is a very, very exciting new normal. And it's being stepped up exponentially right now. Richie? Yeah, hi. Um, I, it's, we, we've been talking about 5G all the time because 5G is, is the way our life is changing. It, it, it's about the change we're doing. And then who knows uh, how much of uh, our life is changing because of Facebook, which is basically based on 5G technologies and building out the artificial intelligence and, and virtual realities. And uh, you know now that we're using Zoom and Zoom cre became popular over other things because of the the useful interface because of the next generation of, of uh, awareness. And uh, I guess I'd like to, maybe we can open up the discussion a little bit. Just what, what do you think is going to be changing? What's happening around us in, in this uh, world of the ether that is changing our lives or that will be changing it in the future? What are we, what limitations have we had that we would like to see go away or that we see go away or that we are seeing going away just being here. I don't know, is there anybody who'd, who'd like to to contribute something right now be, before I maybe add, add a few more things too? Haven't thought about it too much? Well, let me give them a background on 5G then and then and then uh, we can kind of go from there. Is that okay or you want to talk yeah, first? No, why, yeah, why don't you talk about then a little bit of where you okay. where you see 5G happening. So first of all, 5G is already is going to be 10 times faster than 4G. That's hard to believe. And 5G is already in 30 cities that light up their cities with LED. Uh, 5G is responsible for artificial uh, intelligence. I'm a veterinarian, so I was going to say artificial insemination, but I figured I better not say that. Anyway. Um, there's a there's a concept called TAAS, transportation as a service, and you've heard of autonomous vehicles. These are all run by 5G. That is, autonomous vehicle is a, a vehicle run by electric and driverless. Now, what is it already in Arizona? Some fifty thousand autonomous cars. What that's going to do? And, and there's also 35,000 in the next five years, truckers are going to be losing their jobs. Trucks are going to be able to go to one end of the country to the other end of the country in three days. Um, but fossil fuels are going to be significantly less and the power of oil producing companies are going to be significantly less as well. 
we won't be driving a lot of cars and it's uh, actually we won't be driving cars uber and lyft and, and some of these others are going to it's going to be so easy to call and get picked up we're going to have a lot fewer cars the cars that we have are again we're going to be electric they're going to be autonomous they're going to be driverless um another another area that's really exciting is the robotics they've developed the robotics to a point if you have a top surgeon in new york and and somebody in singapore needs a, a specific surgery they'll be able to do that surgery by robotics uh fi using 5g technology one of the most exciting things that i saw is in china one of the things they researched is that the coronavirus is rapidly spread in big buildings and elevators by touching the elevator keys to for your for your uh, floor they have developed four cities now are using holographic touchless elevators so you walk on the elevator you put your finger near but not touching the key um the, it's so successful that they're planning on doing it in other places um and other cities there's over hundreds of thousands of new jobs are being created this is potentially a five and a half trillion dollar business um and so i think the young kids coming up are gonna there's a new generation of jobs are going to be created and the past jobs i think are going to slowly fade away not completely but we need this for our for our world for our environment we need to have less fossil fuels it's made such a significant difference this month or, or six weeks in in our in our pollution levels um another interesting thing about 5g is thermal imaging in airports instead of going through instead of going through um, uh, the security that we go through now they're going to be able to thermal image us and and see if we have anything on us uh, i do that now on animals um the inspector we had at our house used drones and thermal imaging to tell us to do an inspection on the house i thought that was interesting another really exciting thing is 5g uh virtual glasses you'll be wearing these glasses and you'll be having meetings or if you're having a seder or if you're having a company over or you're having a business meeting these glasses will put you right in the meeting basically without physically being there and so you'll be right there um, they're very exciting and they're out already um, so those are some of the things that i see happening uh, with 5g the infrastructure is not completely in yet but it's pretty close apple's coming out with their 5g phone uh, sometime in the middle to the end of this year. Um, that's gonna be very exciting. Um, I think T-Mobile has a 5G phone, but the technology is not there to support it yet. So um, any questions, Richard, you have the floor. Yeah, uh, I just wanted there. to say that uh, the, the things like Internet of Things, which we heard about over the last few years, where you have smart dishwashers or smart refrigerators, Right now, you know, the first round of those things were pretty dumb. They couldn't even tell you if the door was open or some of the, of the refrigerator. But now they're starting to get smarter and smarter. And a lot of the things that we had to worry about, uh, changing the oil in our car, will now be, uh, will be reminded or it, it'll be taken care of for us or we won't even have oil in our car. I guess that's the interesting thing as you, as you think of uh, things that you're doing now being taken care of, well, ultimately, they'll be removed from the need. And that's where electric cars are so beautiful in that we don't have to change the oil in the cars anymore. You know, I bet someone's been developing an app to take, you know, to automate, to come over to your car, lift the hood, take out your old oil and put in brand new oil. Well, he's behind the time. You know, now we've, we've eliminated the motor that needed that. And that that's some of the thinking that's, that's going on that's uh, making things so different. And it's under the umbrella of 5G uh, because it takes a lot of data and a lot of communication between things. And a lot of that's happening in industry. And uh, you know, we have, as we have more automated factories and robots working together and adapting, and we're just uh, seeing the, the beginnings of it in our consumer lives and, and in our religious lives and everything, everything else. Gary? Thanks, Rich. Um, anybody questions on 5G or 4G or the differences? Um, okay. 
I'm just going to impart a little, I, I, I see that uh, sometimes um, we don't know if the next pandemic is going to be worse than this pandemic. If it is, it could be seriously worse. So um, one of the letters that I read, they, they, they address things that you should keep at home. I know it's going to sound weird, some of this stuff, but they say it's really important to keep at home in case you can't go out for three days or four days or five days. Um, I'm just going to read this list and you can, you can add to it or subtract from it, but uh, water, of course, bottled water you should keep at home and keep, you know, in a specific place. Beans, possibly protein bars, a kerosene heater if you live in a cold climate, M52 masks and Clorox wipes and Purell. I know it's going to sound weird, but a hazmat suit, but it could be serious and, uh, and we could have something serious. It could be nuclear, it could be otherwise. A gun, I mean, um, probably most of us don't have a gun. Maybe they do and I'm just naive about it, but um, uh, some method of protection. A knife, foghorn. Uh, they find that foghorns are the number one way of, of getting rid of burglars. They, they just get petrified of foghorns. Why that is, I don't know. So. I just, those are just a few things. And I just wanted to kind of bring that to your attention and, uh, you know, um, and, and uh, kind of lay the groundwork because there will be a next pandemic. Again, we don't know how bad it's going to be. Uh, so before I conclude, is there any other questions? Rabbi Iggy, you want to say anything else? Um, no, I mean, just, you know, this was fascinating, but in, I guess in the spirit of 5G and innovation, that um, I think the world is going to move a lot faster very quickly. And I think uh, we have to adapt. Um, and I think that uh, uh, in the spirit of what I was saying before, uh, for those people that it's harder to adapt, for those people who are more vulnerable, for those people with uh, mental health issues, addiction, people whose loneliness uh, is, is palpable. I know if somebody here who is uh, a reputable, um, hardworking person who is supposed to go back to work, they work at the health center, can't bring themselves to leave the house. And this is somebody who is was perfectly fine, no mental issues, but just the anxiety of going to a mental health, uh, to, a men to a health facility, leaving, leaving after eight weeks their house, going to work, going on the subway, she can't do it. She literally cannot do it. She's, she breaks out in panic and in a real crisis and runs back home. And this is somebody who was healthy. And I think it is our responsibility. And there'll be a lot more of those and a lot more suicides. Where well, we haven't talked about that. I think suicide uh, waves are going to come and wash us very, very deeply. Um, it's already starting to happen. Um, especially when people start opening up again and, and people will feel this dissonance between the world that was and the world that is. Um, and I think that it is our responsibility um, as a movement, as people in communities to take care of those who can't adapt as quickly as the rest of us. Um, and like I said, people with mental health is disorders or people who do not have mental health, people who are just afraid, people in addiction, uh, people who, you know, who come out of incarcerations, um, all these different elements that sort of really are our responsibility to make sure that they're uh, with us because we are really at the end only measured by the weakest link in our communities, not by our strongest. They'll always be strong, but how we treat those who are the weaker link, I think is really the measure of the men that we are and the women they are, the people that we are. So uh, Rabbi Iggy, you, Thanks, Rabbi. I'm gonna just, can I say something, Gary? Sure, go ahead. Uh, you know, you're talking about all, all many things that don't that are residuals of the way things were done in the 1800s. You know, and we can hope that Facebook, that various ways we have of communicating, you know, can can now help people and not just take their money away. You know, we can hope that you know all of these important. Uh, criminals, white collar criminals that are now living in their men, in their homes because it's too dangerous for them because of the the diseases in jails that well now maybe we can send a lot of other people home who really don't have to be in jails and you know that they can live with 
with Big Brother, maybe whatever, with our 5G world to help them. And I agree. I agree. So it's what there was, what there is, and what there will be is what we're hoping to bring out here. Agreed. I would say to that, but then it's our it's our responsibility to accept them, to make sure that they are accepted in our societies, right? To make sure that sort of where right we invite them to the shuls, to the halls, to the families to talk about what they're going through or we're going through, and that's. That's our responsibility. It's one thing to take people out of the jail that they are physically in. It's a whole other thing to really make sure that they're out of the jail, that it's in their soul. I'm going to ask my wonderful wife to say a few words. She's a, um, she's a social worker for uh, one of our local hospitals. I probably, I'm thinking I'm catching her off guard here. Uh, and she does some tremendous work with, um, with pregnant women and, and, uh, and, and the son. She sees everything from the drug addiction on. Leah, do you want to say anything? You got, you got to be muted, unmuted. Alan, can you unmute Leah? Are you supposed to see, you see me? You're not supposed to see me. I, I can see you. <laughs> You're not supposed to see me. I thought I undid myself. No, did you want to say anything? You all said, I, I thank you for asking me, but no, I mean, I, I, I agree with the rabbi. There's, there is going to be many. It, it, the worries will continue. It's, it's going to be very hard. Yeah. Oh, it is. Okay, mute yourself. What's that? Mute yourself if you're done. Oh, mute <laughs> <laughs> Or Alan will mute you. Okay. Uh, in conclusion, I hope this was enlightening to the point uh, and it's given you guys just given everyone some food for thought for the future um creating new ideas and thoughts that hopefully you can take back to your synagogue to your communities uh, but most important to learn about learn enough to be prepared for the future and what it might hold um F, uh so uh again the uh, i talked about the newsletter uh, one thing that is clear we have a lot to think about. Each generation will have some serious souls on what they want their lives to look like. And that, that's an important point. How do we want our lives to look like from here? Um, many of us that are um, baby boomers, we had something set for how we want um, our retirement to look like. Is that gonna, are we gonna be able to do the things? So are we gonna travel the way we wanted to? Can we sail like we used to sail? Can we, uh, you know, horseback ride? Whatever we had plans for, will we be able to do that? And how are we gonna adapt to it? And then the other generations are gonna have to adapt accordingly. Um, how much are we invested in charities? It's obvious that all charities aren't gonna make it. So, you know, we have to find what's best for uh, all of us, and and we really need to put our resources toward it. Said breaking up here. It's going to have to work as a team. It's not going to work as uh, individuals anymore. Um, so again, thanks everybody for joining. Does anybody have any other questions or want to say anything? Alan, Charlie. Well, yes, there's been quite a few stuff mentioned in the news about 5G and the safety of it as far as radiation from it. What is your take on it? So far, I've not read anything heavily detrimental, but I got to tell you, like anything in politics, um, the pundits are going to come out and, for instance, the oil industry and the... Uh, and, and the coal industry and, and some of the uh, fossil fuels, no, some industries by this would be propaganda. And it might be true, but I've not read. Richard, have you read anything about that? No. So that's a good question. And so there's going to be some issues that probably are going to pop up, but that's a good question, Charlie. Um, but I, I, I don't, right now, I don't see how <laughs> the things that we have going on, um, just what global warming has caused. 
Marty. Marty. Hi. Um, I was wondering that w I've been on a lot of Zoom calls and they, the, the picture freezes or, or, or uh, fades out. And I was wondering if I could ask any of the technical people there, why is that? It's just annoying. And is there any way that you can prevent it? Joel, that's you. I can figure that out. No, um, <clears throat> I think it deals a lot with Wi-Fi and, you know, and the, um, the network speed and, and everything going on. I mean, you know, like I said before, I think Verizon, you know, had some articles I read that uh, the amount that they increased the bandwidth of their networks. And I've had a situation in my house where Wi-Fi goes out, you know, on a regular basis for about two minutes and then it's fine. So with having a 17 year old taking AP tests on each of the days that he had to take the test, I rebooted my Wi-Fi first thing in the morning and he never had a problem. So, I mean, I think sometimes we're using it a lot more than we're used to. And, you know, I mean, my only comment would be a typical Microsoft comment where you, uh, you know, you reboot, reboot stuff uh, from time to time to try and keep it fresh. Uh, I think a lot of that's gonna go away with 5G. Yeah, Marty, also I noticed on, on, like on MSNBC when they interview someone from their home, they often have them on a telephone and not using the computer audio. So that, you know, there's ways of getting people to prepare and, and some people like Gary Smith should probably be on his telephone because every once in a while his computer audio seems to bug out. So it's the speed of the Wi-Fi that makes that happen? Well, not just that, but capacity of the Wi-Fi. The, the capacity of the Wi-Fi. And, and that's, wi that's each individual's uh, Wi-Fi at their home or office? Yes. I mean, it depends on what you've got on there. I mean, if you, you know, for me, having a 17 and a 19-year-old at home here, you know, they're, they're streaming Netflix, they're streaming uh, Hulu. Um, I've got the Ring app, you know, so I've got a couple devices there. Um, every little bit takes up that bandwidth. Okay. All right. I think I'm getting it. Thank you. Steve Mandel had a question. Steve? Yeah, I was just going to say um, uh, to thank Rabbi Iggy for doing this. I think he brings um, some spiritual guidance to us. And um, this is not something that just to suggest to Alan and you that whether from our FJMC as Rabbi Iggy um, is, can contribute, whether we want to recognize that as part of the FJMC as he being a spiritual advisor or someone who could participate in further discussions with us and give us guidance. I have a plan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I want to thank all our presenters tonight. Uh, I'm not going to name them because I'm sure I'll skip somebody, so therefore I'll name no one. I just thank all the presenters. They did a tremendous job. Uh, FJMC thanks you all for participating. We hope you will continue to do so. Go to fjmc.org and you will find the schedule for all our webinars coming up. If you would like to give a webinar, you can send me an email to abudman, A-B-U-D-M-A-N, at fjmc.org, and we'd be happy to schedule you. I want to thank everybody again for participating, and uh, please stay safe and healthy. And have a Thanks, very good night. You too. Thanks, Rabbi. I appreciate everything. Take care, everyone. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks,